Welcome. I'd like to say thank you all for coming. Um, it's lovely to see you all here. Um, I did create a really beautiful PowerPoint, <laughs> which I spent a lot of time on, and I've managed to forget. So um, you'll have to apologise. I'm going to go through a few internet attempts instead, which will try and create uh, an impression of uh, what would have been a wonderful <coughs> aesthetic experience. Um, so anyway, without further ado, um, my name is Edwin Kumastaro. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at Courtauld, researching the gender politics of Brexit, visual culture. This is the third and final of my lecture series, Artists on Brexit. And it's a real honour to welcome Thompson and Brokehead here tonight. I'll say a uh, kind of few words of introduction for about five minutes, and then they'll speak for about 50 minutes, uh, followed by a Q&A and a wine reception in the research forum seminar room on the floor above. Are, are we living through apocalyptic times? In January, Vanity Fair informed readers Britain begins stockpiling for the Brexit apocalypse. Say goodbye to tea and medicine, and hello to the emergency rations of freeze-dried chicken. The Manchester Evening News offered a survival guide to the apocalypse and Brexit. Top tips on stockpiling food, water, and running for the hills. Country Farm magazine, a newcomer to an increasingly crowded field, chipped in. UK Apocalypse Survival Guide. Where and how to survive the end of the world. Here is our guide on where to go and how to survive an apocalypse in Britain. <coughs> a couple of months later, The Guardian imagined the imminent end time. Quote, I want to assure you that when the apocalypse has come and you're living in the bombed out remnants of civilization, clad in rags and distilled drinking water from your own urine, the one crackling radio in your resistance bunker will still be bringing news of Conservative Party leadership contests. Politicians on the right have often mocked such rhetoric as talking down Britain. Back in 2018, the then Secretary of State, David Davis, tried to reassure the public by promising, quote, no Mad Max-style world borrowed from dystopian fiction. The subsequent Secretary of State, Dominic Raab, also tried to allay concerns, insisting there would be, quote, adequate food in the case of no deal. Not quite the land of milk and honey as promised. But it would, it would be wrong to think of so-called project fear as an anxiety unique to Remainers. Apocalypticism has long been a defining feature of British nationalism. Books like Peter Hitchens' The Abolition of Britain or Joe Carter's Titanic Britain, had spent the decade since the 2007 to 2008 financial crisis proclaiming the death of Britain due to EU and immigration. In fact, World War II or Dunkirk are used as reference points by leavers precisely to try and recall a sense of retrospective, imagined, national unity in the face of annihilation. Many Brexit voters were motivated by a sense, by a sense that the Britain they had once known was lost or gone. Fears often fed by racists decrying the death of supposed white civilization. This is done today as much as under Enoch Power, Power or the heyday of empire. Almost every political ideology 
uses the spectre of its own collapse. But there is also a sense right now among the supporters of Brexit that something is going terribly wrong. In 2018, the Times decried the end of days feel in Westminster, while MP Bernard Jenkin warned surrender would destroy the Conservative Party. We cannot allow the EU to defeat the British people. MP Boris Johnson called the Irish backstop, quote, the origin of the disaster and a suicide vest wrapped around our constitution. The Titanic springs to mind, he proclaimed, and now is the time to point out the iceberg ahead. The Telegraph's attempts to offer reassurances struggle to inspire much confidence. One journalist told the world, I'm not scared of the Brexit apocalypse. Bring on the zombies and roving biker gangs. We are, of course, at a bigger crossroads here. With the stakes high for the future of Britain, as Britishness itself goes through a violent period of contestation and change. As generational conflicts, broadly speaking, are playing out political battles and media moral panics over capitalism and socialism, anti-racism and the legacy of empire, or gender and sexuality norms. Overlaid on top of and interconnected with these struggles is also technological change from social media to artificial intelligence, and even more urgently, climate change and the future of the planet. The far right has mocked ecological catastrophe as fear-mongering, with Spiked magazine rounding on activist Greta Thunberg for the supposed, quote, apocalyptic dread in her eyes, the explicit talk of great fire that will come to punish our eco -sin. One can imagine her in a sparse wooden church in the Plymouth colony in the 1600s, warning parishioners of hellfire. But the last couple of weeks have also seen considerable critical momentum around the issue of global warming, with groups like Extinction Rebellion or David Attenborough's BBC documentary making clear that we are at a, we are at a tipping point in terms of the Earth's atmosphere. I give all this by way of an introduction to our speakers tonight to bring home just how timely and prophetic Thompson and Craighead's 2016 artwork, Apocalypse, was. The perfume aimed to recreate the end of the world from the Book of Revelation in the King James Bible. Smells including a grievous soul, the blood of a dead man, every living soul who has died in the sea, plagues, filthiness of fornication, flesh burned with fire, and a lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. What might it tell us about our current political moment? Thompson and Craighead have long been pioneers at the forefront of the relationship between art, technology, and politics. Tonight they will speak about their previous work, dealing with subjects from Occupy to the Apocalypse, as well as work they have made recently in the context of Brexit. There are a few others whose practice can both complicate and open up the mess of our turbulent times, with an urgency and a vitality that has marked them out as profoundly important for British art history. I can't think of anyone better equipped to tell us a story of how we got here 
and to help us imagine our possible futures. So to give them their proper bias, John Thompson is Professor of Fine Art at UCL's Slade School of Fine Art. And Alison Craighead is a lecturer in fine art at Goldsmiths and a reader in contemporary art and visual culture at the University of Westminster. Both studied at Duncan of Jordanstone College of Art, University of Dundee. In, 20, in 2004, they were awarded fellowships at the McDowell Colony. In 2012, were ship shortlisted for the Samsung Art Prize. And in 2014, the Noam June Pack Award. Their work has been exhibited across the world, from Tate Britain to Berkeley Art Museum in San Francisco, Moderna Musique in Stockholm, the Centre for International Art, Contemporary Art in Montreal, and the Haus der Kunst in Munich. If you could join me in welcoming them here tonight. Edwin for that introduction, uh, picking us up massively. Um, Shall I explain a little bit about what we're going to do in the next 50 minutes? We thought we would um, split it into three parts. So we're going to show an early work uh, looking specifically um, at Occupy Movement that we made, was it 2012? Yep. Then we're going to jump forward to 2016, just before the referendum. So, in 2016, we had a solo exhibition called Party Booby Trap, um, which is the exhibition that has the perfume that Edwin mentioned. Um, and we're going to use that as a kind of, not a case study exactly, but we'll concentrate on two or three works from that particular exhibition um, as a way of uh, thinking about the period of time that the exhibition happened, because it was just three months before the 2016 EU referendum. And then we're going to look at two works that we've made in the last year, so like post, post Brexit. Yep. Yes. And I think right at the beginning we had got a big uh, admission. Yeah. <laughs> we, we should come clean, I guess. Okay, we, don't, so. we don't make work, we've never made any work that's explicitly about Brexit, but I think the three sections that we're going to present tonight, we want to use as, a, as, as, as kind of different episodes which allow us to think about our relationship with those conditions that have been brought, the conditions that we're living under. Um, and, and perhaps a little bit of context before, just before the EU referendum, and then this kind of endless purgatory that we're currently in, uh, as no resolution appears to be forthcoming from, from the trauma. Yeah, so this selection of work is really us uh, putting the lens of Brexit that we live in um, and thinking about it in relation to our works. The, um, the, so, so I think we should say at the beginning, we're going to screen a work in its entirety. Uh, it's about 14 minutes long, uh, and it's work that we made in 2012 called October, and it's um, about the Occupy movement. We've got a little bit of blurb I'm going to read out, so I will just... Uh, Do you want to read it first or play it? I'll read this first and then we'll just say a couple of things up. Okay, excellent. You know, I can't, yeah. So, October is a documentary artwork about the early rise and fall of the Occupy movement, and it is made entirely from information found on the World Wide Web. First and foremost, October is a portrait of a protest movement, one that rapidly propagated itself through its use of the internet replicating its own language, methods, and behaviours around the world to encompass a diverse range of issues surrounding social and economic inequality. October focuses on two key events, the Global Day of Action that took place on October 15, 2011, where Occupy Wall Street spread almost spontaneously to over 900 towns and cities worldwide, and then a systematic crackdown on many of the camps that had emerged taking place from November 2011. In making this work, we want to consider what it means to witness something that can only be apprehended, represented, and documented through the mediated space of the internet. 
the very same network that spawned Occupy as a global phenomenon in the first place. Um, so there is, we have a reason for showing it, and we have some things we'd like to say about it in relation to Brexit afterwards, but we thought we would just now screen it. Um, it's 40 minutes long. It does contain scenes of police brutality, so if you feel like you don't want to see that, then uh, it happens especially towards the end of the work, then please, by all means, feel free yes. to step out. So the work's in two sections, October and November. So in the November section, the second bit, it gets a bit violent. I'm here because I'm kind of all the injustice in the world, really. For too long, people have abused their power, they've abused their money, they've abused the people to make get their money and their power. Okay, acá están protestando por las viviendas en frente de la municipalidad. Hoy el día 68, creo, de eh, Ocupa y Rosario, apoyando a las familias desalojadas en Rosario. She's a journalist. She's a journalist. I don't care, man. She's a journalist. She works with me. She's a journalist. Get off of her. Fight. Fight. She's a journalist. What are you doing? So you can't cover your face. So they can check anyone, anywhere, anywhere. But they can check, but they cannot. They can't. They can't. They can't. Can. 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 Dude, we ask everyone on the net to we are anonymous. We are a legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Expect us. Expect revolution. We are the 99%. We are the 99%. Hello, I occupy because I see a lot of different issues affecting all of us around the world um, on a local and international level. Um, personally, I'm a, I'm a law student, so I see the inside of the uh, law as a, as a politically um, driven and motivated force where really um, law gains its legitimacy from looking after the people. So I feel that it's got to swing back the other way where corporations and uh, individuals can't have so much of an influence over our everyday lives where it really should be just about looking after each other. So. Yeah, that's pretty much why I occupy. If you have money, you have the freedom to choose your university. If you have the money, you have the freedom to choose what, what, where, which hospital you will go if you are sick. If you have the money, you have the freedom to choose what kind of house and where you want to live. If you have the money, you have the freedom to occupy the position in the government. But if you are poor, you have no freedom. What is money and where does it create, come from? How is it created? I don't think anybody knows. I'm not sure I know. Okay. What's your best guess? I think the banks just printed out of thin air. Oh, yeah, you're, you're right as it happens. <laughs> Did you know that the government prints or borrows money that it has the right to print? No, that I didn't know. Why would they do such a stupid thing? Would you call and ask, please? <laughs>
在美国发起的占领华尔街运动很快蔓延到全世界。目前，日本、德国、韩国、台湾和香港等地近九百多个城市响应占领全球，连中国大陆也低调进行。有网友在脸书上发起“占领北京”活动，不过立即成了敏感词。随着全球的占领风潮，有大陆网友在脸书上号召占领北京，令当局神经紧张。正值中共第十七届六中全会，北京警方果不其然，在有“北京华尔街”之称的金融大街上增加警力部署。不仅如此，目前新浪微博和百度贴吧已经封锁“占领北京”的关键词，在百度贴吧上，甚至连“占领华尔街”都搜寻不到。Things are going to change. Like that's why I'm here to see things change, and I'm extremely hopeful for the future. 
Let's go. We're here in peace. We're here in peace. That day, I lost complete hope in the police. Aquele dia eu perdi completamente a esperança na polícia. And it was my birthday. E foi meu aniversário. And they beat me up. E eles, eles me bateram. Um, but they, because they set up a perimeter and didn't allow the press in. Eles, eles fizeram um perímetro e, e não deixaram ninguém passar. Um, even with their badges. É, inclusive com os seus, seus distintivos. Um, they, they knew how powerful we were. Eles sabiam o quão poderosos nós éramos. And how much an eviction would actually help the movement. E o quanto uma remoção na verdade iria ajudar o movimento. If it was documented. Se fosse documentado. Oh, 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 Please step off the sidewalk, okay? Okay, guys, get bumped off of that a little bit. Don't do it! 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 I want you to have the pepper spray in your face. I want you to have it in your face right now. I want you to have pepper spray. So I'm going to switch. Yeah, so we're just going to, to switch, switch back to the PowerPoint to, I mean, we were showing there a single screen version of the work, but actually it was a gallery work originally, and uh, we've got some pictures of it installed here. So it's, um, instead of kind of like the subtitle where you get the location and the GPS uh, of the place, we use a second uh, screen, which is on the floor, and it's a compass. So the compass... And it, it becomes like an empirical kind of uh, altar, really, to it locates where you are physically, and then it shows you how far away you are from that camp. So instead of seeing the uh, locations along the bottom, as Alison said, uh, what happens as we move from clip to clip is a little pointer, the triangle in the inner circle of the, uh, the compass there, moves around and then tells you where the occupy. Uh, location was, where the camp was, where that clip was recorded, and it tells you how far you are from it, where, how far the installation that's playing is from that location. So the idea is that you're the centre, or the installation is the centre of a, of a data visualisation that's the size of the planet, and that in turn perhaps it forces a sense of self-reflexivity as, as you watch it as well, or at the very least it kind of implicates us all within that space. And I guess uh, the thing that really sh surprised and shocked me about the Occupy movement was actually how global it was. So, you know, um, it wasn't until we started researching that we really realised that there were Occupies in, in China, there, you know, that all over the world, places that you didn't, you know, hear so much about, but it was happening, there was over 900 cities. Not, not much in China, but... <laughs> But even still, uh, that's the only bit that is actually media because we couldn't find first-hand accounts of it um, through, through cameras for that representation. So wind forward now from 2012 to 2016 um, and the solo exhibition we mentioned called Party Booby Trap. So this was in a, in a private gallery in Fitzgerald and um, we, it was called party baby trap. So should we put the first, we'll do a little run round. So there's three works in here that we want to talk about and uh, this gives you, uh, like, actually it's quite nice, we can see right in the middle there's the three works we're going to talk about. So we've got um, the, the video work in the middle, we kind of like, it, we think about it like the backbone actually of that whole show and uh, we'll explain a little bit more about that later. Yeah, I suppose, um, uh, we were, it was April 2016, so we were well aware it was coming, the referendum was coming up. And we tried to make a combination of works. There's quite a lot of new work in the show and some old work, uh, which kind of oscillates or vacillates between 
uh, thinking un about unimaginably big things that transcend the human scale uh, and intensely kind of personal things or things that are very, very kind of um, re re reflective of, of, of personal circumstance. So the first, and, it re and this kind of theme ran through the whole exhibition. So this work here is called Common Era. So Common Era is 16 posters and um, they are predictions of the end of the world. So we gathered up 16 of our favourite end of the world predictions. So I think the earliest end of the world prediction we had was Nostradamus. Now a who, classic. A classic who doesn't love Nostradamus, 1999. <laughs> and then I think the last one we've got is Sh Sh Schroeder and Smith for the, the heat. heat death of the universe. It's a good classic to end on. Isn't it? It's a good big number. So they're actually digital prints, they're not colour pencil drawings, but we created a font of, from colour pencil uh, to, to kind of create a, a sense of them, of them having that kind of aesthetic, slightly the sort of teenager's bedroom aesthetic. But also very fascinated with colouring in books. And we do live in a time of colouring in book fetish, do you not think? It's apparently the, the top selling book last year on Amazon was a colour. So it's a simple array of posters. They're all A1, uh, and it's a documentary body of information, I suppose. Um, and the idea to have them all side by side is so that they can undermine each other. So you have this huge time frame represented, um, but of course, perhaps seeing them at the same time points to a sort of hubris of, of humanity, perhaps, in feeling like we can name our ending. And uh, yeah, and also, you know, it actually cheers me up, that mm -hmm. wall. That wall does actually cheer me up, considering that we've lived through quite so many of them as well. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I find it oddly cheerful. Um, the next work we wanted to talk about is the perfume. So alongside um, those, the common era work in the front room was the apocalypse perfume. And um, uh, John and I, we, we love art. And so when, I mean, I guess that's obvious, isn't it? But when we go travelling, when we're doing shows, we always like to go to the local uh, collection and there's always, in any good local collection in any city, there is normally a depiction of the apocalypse. So we have, it's a little kind of habit we've got into, isn't it? And um, so actually we've been chatting about some of our favourites and then we thought we'd really like to do our own depiction of the apocalypse. But we decided that... Um rather than uh, make a painting, which is the classic encounter that we were having anyway. Um, and because we deal a lot with time um, within our work, we thought we'd make a chemical depiction, uh, which has its own sort of timeline. It plays out on the skin over, over the course of a, a period of time. And that's partly because there are so many ingredients in it. And so many of the ingredients are low and mid-tone constituents, uh, which last a longer time on the skin than high notes. Um, and actually uh, emerge and disappear at different points in the cycle of the perfume. Now, um, okay, so I'm going to ask anybody, and I'm not going to ask you to say anything, but if anybody is really sensitive to smell, put your hand up. Like, if it's a problem. Is that a problem for you? Uh, yeah, it can be. Yeah, okay, so we won't do it, but I do have some perfume, so maybe at the end... Or can, afterwards. Or afterwards, or... we can go outside um, and do a little spray. But it, it's, it, it is intense, and um, yeah. You know, we're going to be in here for another 20 minutes. So we collaborated with a perfumer, of course. Uh, Ewan McCall, who's a, an amazing Scottish independent uh, perfumer, and he was incredible to work with. So this work is a collaboration. You know, it's, it's us and... It's the, equal, it's a three-way yeah, work, yeah. three people. Because um, we definitely could not make a perfume. That's, no. I'm, I'm quite... Ourselves. Well, we could make a one that's terrible. A really um, bad one. And, <laughs> and, the, and, and, you know, in some ways this one is terrible, but the... No, but we, no, no, it's well, not. The, I mean, not. In the most general sense. Like well, kind of I mean, it's such a bit terrible time, but it, it's, it's actually, I'm very impressed because most perfumers only work with maybe three or four scents within a fragrance, and we actually gave them a list of over a hundred because we just went methodically through the Book of Revelations and we wrote down everything in there that had a scent. Yeah, and we went for things that you could sort of associate with a real smell, so it's not 
what does an angel smell like? It's kind of the cracked earth, or it's that, well, Edwin gave a, a glossary of some good. of the terms, yeah. and you can see them, so them here as well. So lots of smoke, lots of wine, lots of blood, lots of ozone, lots of, you, you know, end of the world stuff, lots of horses and poo and filth. And our, start and and our starting point really was to work with Ewan, and we just said we want it to be wearable because we didn't really see it as being very interesting if you make something that's not wearable, and it's a perfume. And it exists as an edition of 50, and I guess that's important to us because we're commodifying the apocalypse, I guess, and we're using the art world as a space to make a sort of satirical statement by producing a luxury product for that market. Yeah, and I think for us that, 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 that is really important, that it is uh, satirical and it is about commodification of end times, um, which is increasingly happening, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So the last work in this show that we're going to talk about at any length um, is The First Person. Uh, and it, it's, it presents as a video work, but it's actually not a video work, it's an instructional work. Um, which uh, plays itself out according to a set of rules. So there's a video of a house that's burning, uh, and it's in a perpetual state of burning down. We, uh, it's a few minutes long, the loop, and we have made it relatively seamless. So this house never really burns to the ground. It's always in kind of constant state of uh, mid, everything is up in flames. And then every minute and a half or so... And we intersect with found um, first-person statements from an American self-help um, um, microblogging, which has since disappeared. It, it was around for about three years. It's really interesting, but it didn't work as a platform. But we grabbed all this selection of first-hand first -hand accounts. So what people would do is they would make a statement in the first person uh, and then try and create a community of like-minded people around it. Uh, and so it exists as a very much a social network, which is, of course, what social media would tend to be call, called in the time of the Occupy movement, and now it tends to be called social media, which I think is quite an interesting shift in the way perhaps we might perceive that platform in the way we name it, or those platforms. Um, what we thought we'd do is we'd try and play just a little bit of it, uh, actually, as it functions. So if you bear with me, I'm going to have to start it up. Oops, I'm okay. back into full screen. So, um, talk I am going to talk. So, um, it, the, when we said it is always changing and it's never the same, basically, it's, um, it's like a bit of minimalist music where everything phases in and out of itself. It's going to just... And it will start... It gets... It's... <laughs> So the video plays for a while, and then in successions, in, in, in triplicate, or rather in sequences of three, um, a, three statements come up at random. They tend not to repeat themselves, they dispose, there's hundreds of them, and over a period of time they sort of dispose of the entire array. And through that you get a kind of, you know, a sort of a sense of poetic continuum, but very much according to these sets of rules. The, the series of three intertitles stops, the video carries on, and there are some sound elements that come and go, and everything phases in and out of time.
highly gain climax the house never burns down completely it's always in a state of burning and you get these kind of uh, kind of cinematic anxiety noises the kind of noise that you get within cinema where something bad is about to coming kind of coming in and coming out and then building and then slowly disappearing again so you're always at this kind of heightened anxiety where well, we hope as a viewer you're always sort of slightly hypnotized but waiting for something awful to happen and i guess the reason we think of it perhaps as the backbone of this exhibition especially in terms of considering the forthcoming referendum is because that soundtrack kind of went through the whole space there's, there's a middle and a back room as well in this exhibition there was another work we made uh, which relates to the balloons you can see called Untitled Balloon Work, which has a video on the floor and a monitor of a corporate balloon drop that took place in a university. Uh, and it's afterwards when uh, actually, uh, it's actually a group of women um, are just popping all the balloons to, to tidy away. Uh, and the balloons that are in the space, which are the same colour, um, have different inscriptions of different uh, allied military uh, operations like Enduring Freedom, Desert Storm uh, and what you have is this corporate balloon drop sounds like weapons fire so this, that sound is kind of goes through the space in, in various, to various degrees and occasionally a balloon will burst um, and then the sound that you heard in the first person also played through the space so that becomes the ambient soundtrack for the whole exhibition um, we had a print in the middle here which refers to J.G. Ballard, actually, it's called Another Advertiser's Announcement. In the middle space there was um, a, a documentary work about a, a man in Scotland who has spent every day uh, of the last ten years or so just taking a time-lapse recording out of his bedroom window. So what we were doing is taking all the Mondays. Um, and showing all the Mondays in one year together. Yeah, and we showed six years of Mondays. Uh, and again, thinking about time perhaps in a more, in a, as a sort of object, but also a kind of quite a, in a, quite a personal kind of endeavour. Um, there was also a work, a kind of kiosk work. Called Help Yourself. Uh, which has a whole array of um, self-affirmation audio recordings. Which we found online, strangely. Which you can um, navigate with headphones. So things like stop smoking, how to make lots of money. How to be charismatic. Yeah, I did lo loads of them. And um, uh, as you went around the corner into the back room, there was a work. Uh, these are light boxes, lenticular light boxes, which um, are corrupt image files and video files, um, which have each has about six frames in, or no, no, 12 frames. And um, they're, because they're lenticular, they move when you move. So they sort of track your movements as you move around the space. But Intrinsically, it's a virus that's eating away at the video there, and we were trying to just look at different ways we could look at destruction and beauty. There was also a work where we used the human genome as a kind of musical score to trigger um, video clips of documentary footage that were broadcast, mostly in English, um, during the time period, 1990 to 2003, uh, which was when the first human genome was being sequenced. So we use the kind of base constituent of uh, a human being, the code, the, the base code of a human being, um, as a way of perhaps apprehending a sort of more messy picture of us through a sort of documentary gaze. But it's also poetic in the sense that the rule is, because a genome is only made up of four letters, T, A, G and C, albeit 3.2. I love that only when there's 3.2 billion. Yeah. Only um, 3.2 billion. And, and, so, so, and so as it triggered a piece of video, it would just be one word, beginning with the letter T, A, G, or C. So uh, terrorism, uh, um, terrorism, Christianity. Uh, it's, it, there were, and there's a, there was about, there's, there's a data a library of a, a good few hundred clips. So it becomes like a poem that just constantly cycles randomly. The rules for this particular work were that... Um, uh, it would trigger a clip, beginning with that letter, and uh, at random, but if the letter repeats, the clip would repeat, otherwise everything's at random. So the work is called Stutterer, and it's a little bit like having an out-of-control parrot in the room. So, you know, it just shouts, um, and you're never quite sure what it's going to shout. <coughs> and it's also, the work is made to play once, and then self-destruct. And when I say self-destruct, it just won't play again, it doesn't explode. Just, just the one. So, and it, the lifespan of it is 83 years, which is the same kind of 
kind of lifespan as a African grey parrot. So there's quite a nice symmetry there. And this last work is about different sites of nuclear waste and how long in seconds it will take for them to become safe again. And the time frames vary between about 47 years to about a million years. So, you know, everything is very much about the human sphere of influence, whether it's personally or collectively as a society, but then also we're touching inhuman kind of time frames. So the whole exhibition oscillated in this way, trying to kind of provoke a kind of anxiety, if you like, in us, which is certainly what we felt uh, as we went towards the, the referendum. And the referendum just hung there with the exhibition. And I, I think one of the things that we... Uh, increasingly like to do is think about how we measure ourselves as humans and how we mark ourselves. So whether it's about being able to decipher the human genome and you know like celebrating that as an activity and how long it took and that amazing collaborative thing because uh, it was done collaboratively all over the world with different labs or whether it's about thinking about what is going to be our legacy and what's the oldest cultural artifact that we have made, or it's going to live, uh, which will be nuclear waste. So we're kind of trying to, we think at the moment, so it's trying to look at the kind of span about how far we touch, or how we measure ourselves, or what we might leave. So um, we're going to talk about just two more works now. Uh, and I guess rattling through that whole exhibition also is a way of perhaps trying to give you a little snapshot of uh, the wider practice that we have. So I guess uh, we're moving on to work that we've been making in the last year, and then I think for everybody, I think uh, who's making work or writing, it's a really anxious and interesting time to be making work. And um, I think the two works that we're going to show, I hope, um, are are actually quite cheerful for us. Yeah. Um, the that celebrate a little bit more or yeah. try and show. Um, some of the really positive things. Yeah, well, certainly the last work, I think. Yeah. But, um, uh, this piece is called Here Not Here, and it's a public commission that we just completed. Uh, it's been, it, you can go and see it, actually. It's in a new student centre um, at UCL in Bloomsbury uh, on Gordon Street. Uh, and you, it is a public space. You can actually walk into that student centre uh, there's a sculptural work by Rachel Whiteread, and then as you go up the stairs um, and then to look to the right, then you see the work that, that we've completed. And it's a, a live data feed that forms the basis of the work, and it's called Here Not Here. So we've got two screens, and on each screen um, we are showing uh, country names. And one of the screens is the screen that shows you of students that are here at UCL in the student centre and then the other screen shows com countries that aren't represented in UCL, hence the name Here Not Here. So it's a very, very simple idea but actually we became hugely interested in the kind of meaningfulness of country names and the meaninglessness at the same time of so um, I, guess, uh, I guess what we wanted first and foremost is for it to be a visualisation of the whole world, uh, albeit through a list of country names. We weren't listing, we don't list dependent territories. For example, we just use uh, the kind of the most reductive country list that's available, which is, uh, uh, I can't remember how many countries it is, 400? Um, but... Uh, um, and we concatenate it, so it's an endless list that scrolls through. So Using the ampersand, so it'll be Ukraine and Colombia and Cyprus and some back. So you've got this kind of endless and, and which makes it almost beginning to feel um, a little bit um, relentless but prayer-like as well within its kind of language. But you can see here the movement of the work. Um, which is letter by letter, simultaneously, uh, and um, the grid through which the, the country names pass through, we hope, creates a kind of, a little bit of a, a decorative abstraction. So the country names themselves start to decohere a little bit. Um, you know, where are we, where's here? Um, the idea of being here, not here, we hope operates in 
different kinds of ways. But what persists is the fault line that lies between the two screens, uh, making visible on the right what's usually out of sight and perhaps out of mind, and then on the left, um, the, the, the population currently of the university. It, it, feed, it takes from a live feed that is produced by human resources at UCL. So it operates in real time. It updates every 15 minutes or so. Obviously, nothing might change every 15 minutes, but um, the, 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 the work will respond to the conditions. And I guess using the university or the institution uh, as the basis for this visualisation, um, we're perhaps thinking about wider ideas of identity and um, what it is to think of the world as a list of countries, um, but also perhaps for the comings and goings of London's global university, as they describe themselves, um, that, that perhaps it acts as a kind of mechanism or an object of contemplation that is also a mechanism that reflects conditions, perhaps wider conditions, about freedom of movement. Freedom of movement, but also things like, uh, you know, some of the countries will be coming up and you realise that they're there and there is actually no population because there no longer can be a population. So you have, you know, the, the, every time you, a country comes up, you, you kind of have a conversation, especially in the not here section, I think, about why. Why are there no students there? Um, so, yeah. Um, there can be lots of different reasons. There are, there are very many colour changes that happen in the work over a very long period of time. Uh, and again, we're hoping that that colour cycling that happens quite, not imperceptibly, but it happens uh, fluidly, um, that, that it also helps the work exist kind of almost as a sculptural entity. Um, they're very big screens, they're very high resolution. Uh, and they lean forwards into the space, so they have a kind of architectural bearing as well. Okay. So that's here, not here. So the last work we're going to show you is called Saffron, and um, it's uh, a video installation that we made for a show in Inverness City Art Gallery, and and we wanted to, we were really interested. We spent half our time in the Highlands, and we were really interested in trying to map um, diversity in the Highlands because um, you know, spending half our time in London and then jumping up and being in the Highlands, you notice a difference. So we started looking for ways to, to talk and think about it and we became very interested in doing a portrait of an incredible woman called Kasia Perlek, Perlek um, who runs a, a world food shop in a Victorian market in Ghana. Sorry, it's Kasha Pogo. Pogo. Okay. So, um, we started by um, yeah. So she she was very kind, and we interview and talk her talk to her in the video. But I guess in making a portrait of uh, a contemporary um, person, it's a sort of contemporary Scottish portrait, if you like. We thought it was interesting to consider uh, a Polish woman. Uh, running uh, what is locally known as the Chinese shop, um, in which is a shop unit in the Victorian market in Inverness. So that seemed to be a very multi-layered space within which, um, through a long interview we had with her, we presented lots of stories and anecdotes about how she kind of connects a global network of, of import and export in terms of food with... Um, with a, a kind of network of communication in the highlands of Scotland. And so over the course of a period of time, you hear lots of things about the kinds of people that come in the shop, um, uh, where they come from, uh, and so on. There's a clip here, so we'll play it for a little bit. It's, uh, it's about two minutes long, and you'll get a flavour of the work. And someone from a you know, shop somewhere there, they didn't know what was this. And like, they didn't recognise the smell, because I kind of covered it with a cloth. <laughs> to the air freshener, and <laughs> she was saying, "Oh, the corridor here." I um, I came to Inverness because it was, you know, summer was fine, but, but you know, winter in a village, and it, it was something I didn't like the life in the village, you know. And I tried to kind of keep, try to keep myself busy, so I found no one was like, offering a full time contract, but so I have a like a few days here, a few days there, and actually it was really good. 
because it led me to know people. And then one day, the lady who had the shop, she said, they were selling the shop, the, the, what was the spice this? And I thought, without having money, without having experience, uh, I thought, I'll buy it. And I got a selection from China, Malaysia, India, Thailand, Philippines, uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, Taiwan. With the real complex problems of the Middle East. First time, first uh, for the delivery, I went to Glasgow, took my friends with me, and we took we took a bus, <laughs> and we took this big supplier, and I thought these Asian people are crazy. Why the hell do you so much soya sauce? I didn't realize before that that the person was for us. I didn't know anything about Asian food, anything. <laughs> Here, I think the space, because the space is very limited, you know, I would like to make um, like a, a, you know, a Chinese section, and then a Japanese section, and then um, the, I don't know, Thai section. The space is limited, so I'm kind of limited by that. But on another side, I really like being eclectic. And <laughs> I think this is what I need. This is my form of being eclectic. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I'm always saying, if I win the lottery, I'm opening a shop in Stornoway. Um, because there's a lot of people from Stornoway, lots of customers from Stornoway. Um, and there's obvious a, a, a British clientele, as well as uh, people that are from Thailand and they live here, um, Philippines, Malaysia, um, Chinese, obvious. Uh, not only Inverness, it's Inverness, but it's quite wide range because it's Inverness and Dingwall, uh, as well as uh, Sky, big, big clients are from Sky, uh, Orkney, Shepherd, Stornoway. Um, you know, I can, I can provide the. So that gives you a little taster of, of Kasha and also a little bit of video. The whole video is how long? It's about, about 12 minutes. 12 long, minutes. Um, over the course of that time, what sort of becomes clear is just actually, uh, I, I guess, how much, um, how much love is in her, really. And it ends up explicitly talking about love. Um, in the space itself, uh, you see these kind of protest banners uh, with the words, the key words, that run through the interview. And when it's projected, because you get that intertitle with the keywords, um, you get quite an interesting, or well, we found it interesting, the, the kind of the, a sort of a seesaw between this word cloud and then this quite televisual sort of um, testimony from home. And yeah, and I guess we learn, I, I get from talking with her, uh, you learn a lot. You learn a lot about where you live. You learn a lot about... Um, how other people live and how other people understand things. But I guess this is one of the works that we set out uh, with a set idea about interviewing Kasia and what kind of answers she would get, we would get from her. And actually, she, we got completely different answers, didn't we? And then this recognition that this work was actually really about a celebration and actually about love and the love and energy that this woman brings to this tiny, tiny shop that has now created this kind of really incredible network right across the Highlands. Um, and I guess in making that work also, we're perhaps trying to think about ideas of uh, positive resistance as well as kind of offering critique or spaces for us to consider our situation anthropologically as well. Yeah, and I think we're, we're very pleased and very excited that um, Inverness Art Gallery uh, decided to acquire it and put it into their collection. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for a reasonably small um, museum in the Highlands, it's their first video um, mm -hmm. piece. And, but also, I think it's, yeah, it's quite an unusual, I'm just really pleased that she's now in their collection as a, you know, as a person of importance to the city. Yes. Yes, so and I think the other thing as well that we're very pleased about is that um, the National Poetry Gallery of Scotland are also interested in showing it as well. So f for us, it's, um, it's, a, it's really wonderful that actually other people are 
feeling the energy of, of what she brings into the city. And in many ways she represents everything um, that the hard Brexit here doesn't. Thank you. That's it.